when we get off the floor, we're going to be here working with Priya, finish up our testimony with Priya. And then 10. Huh? We'll be stopping with them. Oh. And then at 10.30, we've got a joint meeting down in room 10 with House Judiciary. I, I, think, so, I think someone should this have morning, yes. um, <laughs> either Mike Davis <laughs> in Judiciary or Peggy Delaney. So, um, so, room 10. Mm -hmm. so, so we'll try to finish um, up like at quarter after 10. I will 10. try to be so down, down, down there to make certain um, that this it will be set up. Uh, Mike the Bailey came by and asked um, me to... Proposals? Uh, they're going to go quickly through the PowerPoint that they went through yesterday. So their proposals, basically the proposals deal with good time, taking off the programming requirements, and maybe extending it to seven days versus five days. They're looking at a presumptive Are you concerned about the last talk? who have been on furloughs for four months and are doing well. Presumptive parole would only be for those with non-domestic crimes uh, to start small. Someone else should have. They are looking at community systems for support for people who I are on um, furlough, particularly housing. Someone has requested that. Josh. If, if it's not um, there, it will be able to be set up in that. moments. Because and then there was a fourth one. Very close to the yeah. end. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know at this point what the fourth that would probably that, that would probably be the best yes. thing for me to do Cassandra. I haven't even been getting yes. all of the <laughs> yeah, so that's what they're going to present um, your slide deck a few moments ago so and I was assuming I'm going to wait for Phil to finish up there um, so I said I'm going to All the roll calls so far, you and I have voted the same. Uh, this is a good time. <laughs> I'm consolidate, to oh, and consolidate, okay. and consolidate your furlough statuses. Mm -hmm. So there's too many um, different statuses of furlough. So that's what's creating people coming in. And they were saying if you do these, we can save anywhere from 106 to 135 out of state beds. So you don't have and that would be a savings of about $11 million dollars that could then be reinvested into DS. <laughs> yeah, that would probably work for a couple of years. My for the legislature holds the best out of They said have Look dedicated funds so it doesn't Mary get pulled. Yeah. 11 million? Yeah. You Maine, still have out of state beds. Maine built their uh, women's reintroduction. Move that money. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, they didn't have to buy land. Mm -hmm. That's true. They didn't have to buy a secure, they didn't have to build a secure facility. Yeah, they didn't have to. Yeah, it would be hard. Enough. So, anyway. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, um, uh, Sarah Pope and Francis and I had a brief conversation in the parking lot last night. About what we've been hearing in terms of uh, when there's allegations um, and how it goes up to the Department of Human Resources and um, how that is playing out in the corrections world and also looking at qualifications or uh, salary of correction officers and that impacts the classification and everything that pertains to government work. So we're going to have a joint meeting talking about okay. it. Oh, great. Yeah? I did hear a little bit uh, yesterday up in appropriations about um, investigations, the hotline, uh, how corrections has more investigations than any other department of state government. Well, they're dealing with people hands-on in a right. confined Sa environment. Yeah, and there's a situation where safety is a, an issue. But, uh, safety being what? Well, safety for... If you're relying on a fellow officer to Have keep you safe and you don't trust that, then that's 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 a pretty serious situation. Um, but uh, what was I to say? Um, so the hotline now for DOC staff Boy, goes, goes directly to the general counsel's office at the Department of Human Resources. And where was it going before? I don't know. It was going internally, wasn't it? Yeah. I, 
Would you like me to answer that? So the agency, it was originally the Agency of Human Services hotline that was for offenders and staff. Um, and then when Rob Hoffman was the Agency of Human Services secretary, uh, the agency said we will no longer be answering this phone. That was a long time. And I was just going to say. And the department um, attempted to get that line to be answered. Because um, again, it was this is part of Mark's McLaughlin said that there is a very strong value in this hotline. We need the hotline, and so we attempted to. Uh, we worked with the network uh, through a grant uh, with Priya to have it answered by the network. Um, but unfortunately, uh, because of the way the phone system works, it would only call the uh, Rutland shelter. Um, we don't know why, but that's what would happen. Uh, we tried to get prisoners' rights to answer it. They they said that they could not. Um, and I know, uh, I know there was one other group we attempted to work with, I don't remember who it was, um, and they would not answer it, so the department kept it itself because it was better to have something than nothing. Um, and so that's sort of the, the history of that hotline. And we attempted, uh, when Mike Touchette was the facilities exec, and then when he was the commissioner, he attempted again to resurface conversations to get that phone answered. And, and Unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. uh, but. No, go ahead. Because I, I heard part of, the, part of it and then I, <laughs> I got screwed up trying to download those things. So I had to focus on something else. So, where is the hotline now? <clears throat> is it with the Attorney General's office through the legal counsel? I, uh, my understanding from email is that it went, it's going directly to the agency's office. Still? Uh, that may have changed, and okay. I just don't know that. Okay. Nobody wants, you yeah. know, what what it feels like between where staff can report and then where inmates can report. It mm -hmm. seems nobody wants to deal with it. Mm -hmm. That is correct. It's a hot potato. Yes. Yeah. Nobody he, wants to deal with it because I know Mike Touchette's been looking for, was looking for an independent entity yeah. for a number of months prior to the article, for a number of months. Years. For mm -hmm. the inmates. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants it. We have been told it's too frivolous. No one has time. And there was a concern, um, again, what originally stopped, um, and Karen referenced it, uh, Director Transcard Scott referenced it when she was up here, the who would have thought the phone would be so complicated. Um, Zoe Gaskin was working for the network then, and we had a sub-grant with them, and we worked on it for over a year uh, to try and get that hotline. Um, <laughs> Some legislators that might be willing to stack the hotline. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, and, and I, and, 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> for about no, two no, seconds. I'm not saying that to you. For about two seconds, Alice, really so the first problem arises. So I understand the problem with the phone a lot because you just can't put a phone on the wall and say hotline. Because the minute you get on the hotline, everybody in your in your unit knows that you're doing something. So it's really complicated about yep. the facility and the location and yep. the confidentiality and who you're talking to, it goes way, way too deep. I don't think people understand enough that it goes way, way beyond the television. Mm -hmm. Way too deep. And, and because of those complications with the phone, that was why the department did change its policies um, in regards to mail, so that um, uh, when we provided the, the network addresses, um, our mail directive was reflected that um, any mail that was sent out to um, an advocate was considered legal mail and therefore was not to be read. Um, so there was that amendment made um, in our policy because we know that it's challenging for an inmate to be in the unit and make a, a report of sexual assault. So if you can write it, it's more confidential. It comes back to a question that I had, like, isn't this a requirement of PREA? I mean, to me it seems yep. like it seems like it's not an, really an optional. The re oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the requirement for um, under the PREA standards is that we have more than one method for an inmate to be able to make a report. It does not require that it's a hotline um, for this very reason because of the complications of the unit, confidentiality, uh, and so we have um, the external line uh, that can be called. Uh, there's an email address and a phone number that rings directly to the PREA office um, so that folks can call in uh, and make a report that way. We do use uh, or reference um, the hotline that was being answered by um, out of the commissioner's office, which was the one that used to be the agency's 
line. Um, we provide the advocate uh, addresses um, and phone numbers as well, so uh, inmates can write, um, or they can also notify uh, their family member that can call in. Um, we do provide the prisoner's rights number, um, as well as prisoner's rights address for folks to be able to write or notify a family member that can then call. There was an attempt made to be able to have um, prisoner's rights be a direct dial, but again, that was, um, prisoner's rights said they did not have the staff to be able to, to do that. Well, maybe what we need to do, maybe that's one of the things we as a committee can really work on in terms of <coughs> um, Excuse me. Saying, hey, the state has to have a dedicated line that goes to an independent outside of the agency of human services <coughs> that goes somewhere. And, and, the, and the PREA standards have two different sets, one of which is that offenders have the ability to make a confidential report that there's no obligation to follow through. So that, in other words, a person can seek care and, and safety for themselves, regardless of, of wanting to make a report. The other obligation is that we have means for people to be able to make a report that comes back to us. Um, so there's those two different requirements, and that's um, what, prison because prisoners' rights is, they're also state employees, that's um, the group that we are using, so when a report goes to them, they would notify us of the allegation that was reported so that we can investigate it. So to be clear, you're, you're, you are following pre standards? Yes. Yes, we are. You may want to go beyond that. Go ahead. Okay, let's shift gears. So, we're going to continue uh, our presentation from the Department of the Korea Offices of the Department, uh, just to give us more background, and we have some <coughs> new folks who are sitting around the room, so I would suggest, Heather, if you could start just introducing yourself, and then we can go around the room. Yes, thank you. Heather Simons, Director of Training and Professional Development, Department of Corrections. Hi, Kelly Chamberlain, um, Field Training Coordinator, Department of Corrections. Anna Lane with the Vermont Commission on Women. I'm Tom Absamar, I represent the Vermont State Employees Association. Jessica Barquist, I'm with the Vermont Network. Thank you. It's all yours. <laughs> Good morning, um, and thanks again for having us back. Um, so this morning what we you have... Just introduce yourself to the broker. Sorry, that's fine. Uh, Jennifer Sprafke, the Prison Rape Elimination Act Director for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, so this morning what we had for the agenda is we wanted to cover um, three main topics that are really about the vulnerabilities of folks in correctional facilities. Um, so one of which is acknowledging the pathways and profiles of women offenders and how it's different uh, for that of men uh, coming into the system. Uh, the second one is gender care and custody, which I did um, already come and talk to you guys a, I don't know, a few months ago a little bit about transgender inmates and what that means. Um, today, talking about the vulnerabilities uh, that um, folks encounter when they come into a correctional facility and that they're in an increased risk of sexual assault. Um, and then the last part is acknowledging the difference. I know Chair Emmons has referenced a few times um, in committee about the importance of men. Um, the article uh, focused on women, um, but acknowledging that we house males as well, um, and understanding that rape itself has a different um, definition at times. In some cases, legal, um, uh, the law is different as far as how it reflects to men, and societal perception um, about uh, gender and sex and rape uh, when it comes to men that can increase vulnerabilities in a correctional facility. One thing for sure is that it'll decrease um, the reports that you're likely to get because um, males are less likely to report sexual victimization. So those are the, the three main topics um, for this morning. So I wanted to start uh, by talking about women offenders. Um, and what you have in front of you, I'm not going to go through every slide, um, but this is the presentation that we deliver um, to uh, staff at the Correctional Academy. I was actually just there yesterday and delivered uh, both the Pathways and Profiles of Women Offenders and the Gender Care and Custody curriculum. They have an entire day split in two. Um, and uh, really, the, the thing I wanted to start with is acknowledging what, what brings women into a correctional facility is different than what brings men in. 
Um, we know that uh, women's introduction to um, crime is usually connected to um, a partner or a familial connection. It's not a stranger, it's not an experiment, it's connected to a relationship. So when you're asking somebody to quit um, or to get clean, in most cases you're asking them to end a relationship, um, which, well, if you've ever asked, any, asked anyone to break up with someone, that's real complicated. Um, and the best way I can describe it is if anybody's ever been a smoker, um, you smoke in certain contexts. You either smoke when you go to the bar, you smoke when you drink, um, you smoke when you drive in a certain location. And what's really hard for folks is when they quit smoking, when they experience that event, they really want to smoke because that external event is a trigger. Um, and so for women, a lot of times, the relationship is the trigger. Uh, and so they can't end one without the other. Um, for example, a woman that I had on my caseload, um, we were doing an uh, assessment, and I asked her, when did you start using? And she said, oh, you know, I started when I, yeah, I was like 11 or 12. I said, okay. And I asked her if she thought she had a substance abuse problem. She said no. And then when we went through and looked at her use, um, it was clear she had um, been expelled from school. She missed work. Um, she couldn't really be stable because of her substance use. And so obviously there's a perception issue around what's a problem. Um, and when I asked her why she started using, um, what she said is her mom um, smoked marijuana and um, when she was a kid, and when her mom was smoking marijuana, she wasn't allowed to be out of her room because that was her mom's version of good parenting, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to use, but I know you shouldn't be here, so you stay in your room. And so this 11, 12-year-old girl figured out that if I want to spend time with mom, then I need to start using. Mm -hmm. And so she did. She started smoking pot. <coughs> Uh, she went out into the living room, she sat down, she started smoking, and her mom didn't kick her out. And so the message to her was, that's my connection. It's not that drugs are bad, it was the only way that she could actually have that relationship with her mother and have that connection. And so that's one story, but the reality is every single woman in our care and custody, good morning, uh, it's okay, no, you're all right. Um, every woman in our institutions has that same story. It might not be 11 or 12, and it might not be their mother, but it's going to be someone they know very well, someone they love um, or loved, uh, someone that said they loved them, and so the use is what is the bridge between them and that individual. And so one of the things you know in working with corrections is you can't it, just say no didn't work for a reason. If you just put in substance abuse treatment where you talk about how risky it is and be clean, that's not enough when you're working with women because women aren't compartmentalized that way. One of the catch phrases that's out there that's actually the best I've ever heard is that women's crimes are embedded in the styles of their lives. Their crimes are, their drug use is, their patterns are because they're pervasive. They're, everything is connected to something else. You will often see women who are um, selling drugs because they don't have a job, because they don't have employment skills, because no one will hire them, because they are the caretakers of the children, they can't get the kids in daycare, then they can't afford daycare, they can't afford to work, because they can't, they have nowhere for the kids to go, and they know if they don't provide for their children that they're going to go through termination of parental rights. So, what's your choice? If you find a job that's not enough to cover daycare, you run the risk of losing your children. So you don't work. But then the external is that the world sees that you're lazy, and you're willing to be on welfare. That you're not motivated to work. And then when that's the way folks treat you, then that's how you feel. And we know from the news and what we see that when women don't feel good about themselves, they're more likely to go to a doctor and doctors are more likely to prescribe them medication. As a society, women are over-prescribed medication for depression, anxiety, um, and then the more medication, the more likely we deal with addiction. And 
the phrase that you'll hear uh, among <clears throat> the majority of the population is chasing the dragon. I don't know who came up with that. Um, I'm not sure why it's a dragon, uh, but referring to that addiction, that once you use once, that first high is amazing. And every addict will tell you, every time they're used, they're trying to get that high again. And one of the things that's unique about women is it is actually harder for women to achieve that high than it is for a male. Um, one of the reasons is because women have more fat cells than males. Um, just the way we're built. And when you use drugs, that substance is stored in your fat cells. So if you use one day and then use two days later, you still have some of that in your system. So the next time you use, you need more. So because of genetic makeup of women, they need more the next time. And then when you add in the connection, when you add in trauma and self-medication, you can see how it snowballs. And so when we train staff on working with women offenders, the place you have to start is understanding what got them there. Understanding that it's not just one thing. What we see with males is they come in, they have an alcohol problem, they have a drug problem, they either do treatment or they don't. They go to group or they don't. We don't see the quote drama. We don't see the argument. Um, the resistance, they go. Because they say, listen, I just gotta go do this group, get this off, get check, all done, and then I can move on to the next thing. But if my drug use is connected to my relationships, my criminal history, my family, as I have kids that now I'm not home with, my job history, my education, quitting that substance isn't just that simple. Um, and so it complicates the work that we do, um, which is why I'll tell you that I like working with women more than men because it's exciting. There are so many facets uh, to pay attention to. It's never boring. Um, and I know um, Director Simons talked in testimony before about um, when we go back in time, the history is you'll hear staff say, I'll take a use of force. I'll work with men, I'll pick a use of force because that's easy. Dealing with the verbal challenge of working with women is hard and it's exhausting. And so that is true in life. I mean, males that we know in life, females that we know in life will say, oh my gosh, I don't want to get into an argument with a woman. <laughs> I mean, that was actually... What members say? Well, it was almost sort of said this morning. You hear everything and you've got eyes in the back of your head, right? That notion that you don't win. Um, and so... Um, it's no surprise then that you would have staff, whether male or female, say, I'd rather engage in a use of force because we're the Department of Corrections. So sometimes that's what folks think they're in for. But what we know of today's workforce, and it happened yesterday with the class I'm training, is that's not what they're here for. They didn't sign up to work for the Department of Corrections because they can't wait to engage in a use of force. They just spent 40 hours, an entire week, learning how to communicate. And while I'm training working with women offenders, one of the things we talked about is, why is it that a woman might not want to shower? Why might she not want to shower? One of the tools that we give them is there's a video called Healing Neem, uh, which I can actually send um, to the committee if it's something you would like to watch. Um, and it's a, a video about a, a woman who is, um, she's a, actually a spokesperson now across the country. Um, she had over 100 offenses career criminal, uh, started when she was a kid, um, never gonna get out of the system, drug user. Um, she had um, every risk score you could imagine, top of the line. One relationship, turned it around, she got herself clean and sober, and now she's a spokesperson for that experience. One of the things that she talks about in the video is her mother. And she, like every other young girl, loved her mother a lot. And her mother was a cocaine user and a drinker. Um, started using probably before Neen was even born. Um, and her mother didn't really care for her. Um, and used her as a babysitter for her younger siblings. Um, and um, at one point, uh, when Neen was 14, her mother <coughs> signed her over legally to get married to one of her mother's ex-boyfriends. Mm -hmm. 
And um, when Neen got clean, um, she still has a relationship with her mother, which is very, I mean, you actually see video footage of them interacting. And it's very tenuous because her mother still uses, her mother asks her for money when she sees her. But what Neen talks about is all she ever wanted was her mother's love. That's all she ever wanted. And at one point, her mother said to her, I want you to come home. And Neen was thrilled. Her mom finally wanted her. When she got home, she realized, no, her mom just wanted her home to be a babysitter. And she talks about how when she, her cousin, she, her cousin sort of adopted her and took her in to take care of her. And she was, I think, 11 or 12 years old, maybe 13, I can't remember the exact age. And she didn't know how to shower. Her mother had never taught her how to bathe. And so I asked the class yesterday, when you have someone who isn't showering, what do you do? What do you say? Do you know what it means? And we talked about that video and how it might be that she doesn't want to shower because she doesn't know how. It might be that she doesn't want to shower because she doesn't want to take her clothes off because she's been a victim of sexual assault. It might be that she's watched every video you have as well and she's afraid she's gonna get sexually assaulted in the shower. And so we don't train staff to say, go take a shower, you sink. We train staff to say, hey, I noticed you haven't taken a shower. And we wait. Mm -hmm. And we don't do it in the middle of the day room. We pull them aside. And can you imagine if that's you having to fill that silence? You're not going to say, I was sexually assaulted, I can't go in there. You're not going to say that. I don't care how quiet of an environment it is. Those are words that are so painful and so hard to say. So we wait, and if they don't say it, then we can offer it up. One of the things we can do is, would it be helpful if you showered during head count? Would that be helpful? We have soap, do you need soap? And we'll have that dialogue hoping that those prompts will get a response. And one of the recruits asked me in class, well, what if they don't respond? What do we do in that moment? Because I don't want to embarrass anyone. And I said, that's OK. It's not critical, and it's not an emergency. So wait. Then you talk to a supervisor. Then you talk to a caseworker. We pull them off the unit and offline. We say, tell me what's going on. Because here's what I know. You had a rule that says you have to shower. Because here's the other thing. They're not alone. They're sharing a cell. They're in a unit. Eventually, there's going to be an odor, and now they're going to get shamed. Somebody's going to say something. So we have a duty to protect her, too. So we have to find a way to balance that out. So when we're training this at the academy, and that's one of the things I want to talk about with that article, is it's not just that simple. It's not just about a shower. It's not just about a DR. It's not just about drug use. It is layer on layer on layer. The women that we see, this has been going on for generations. To use Neen again, her mother married her off when she was 14 years old. She talks about the first time she used meth was because the husband that she had, it was a domestic violence situation. She couldn't clean the house enough. She couldn't clean it fast enough. And so the response was domestic violence. He would abuse her. So she used, someone introduced her to meth, and she, she actually says, I clean my house, I clean the neighbor's house, I clean every house on that neighborhood. And she said, I never got that beating again. That's what it took for her. So when we provide those programs, we are not just saying methadone, meth, methamphetamines, cocaine, crack, it's not good for you. How do you tell that woman that it's not good for her? Because that's what saved her. And we judge that survival skill, but that's a survival skill. She lived and she chose herself and she used the intervention she could at that moment. So when we provide these programs in a correctional facility and these correctional officers are experiencing these women, we have to tell them first that there's a backstory you may never know. But you have to assume that some of this stuff is true, that she has experienced that trauma. So we don't yell across the day room. We don't slam doors any more than we have to. But here's the other thing. Jails are trauma triggering, period. I know that I actually think that actually came up in, in committee earlier. The doors slam. The radios are loud. 
There's yelling. There's movement. There's a flashlight shining in your shell in the middle of the night. You don't control the lights. You don't control the time. You don't control when you get up. People make you take your clothes off. Jails are trauma triggering. So we have to know that when we partner with the network that you can't do deep trauma work in a correctional facility. Anyone who does trauma work will tell you that that actually is more detrimental to the individual because you are then exposing them. You can't break down a wall and keep them in a bad environment. That's unhealthy. So it's survival and it's mitigating as best as we can, but you can't do deep trauma work. That work has to be done outside of an institution, um, outside of the system, um, where they actually are in control of some of those safeguards. Um, some of it can be done in some of our transitional houses. Um, some of the programs we work with, um, Northern Lights, um, Aries House, um, Dismiss, some of that work can be done there um, because of the structure of the setting and that they aren't locked in. Um, but they still have roommates. Um, they're still not in, in control of who they live with, um, and they're not alone, um, so that may also be limited um, at those points in time. Um, but I really wanted to kind of expose you to the picture of what we know we see, and we're not unique. This is what Corrections is seeing across the country. So it's no surprise um, if folks don't know, the discipline data across the country is that women offenders are over-disciplined. And what that means is they get more DRs um, or discipline reports. Now, I'm not going to say that they get more DRs for assault, because they don't. Um, right? We have a range. We have minors, we have major Bs, and major As, which is, are the most serious. And there's two things we know across the country. And there's a work group that spent, uh, I think, five years developing a discipline manual to help folks um, modify how they do their uh, discipline within institutions. One is you ask a guy to go empty his garbage can, and he empties it or he doesn't. It's that simple. And anybody who's been married, whether man or woman, or had a child, you say, empty the garbage can, and they either go empty it or they don't move. Now, you ask a woman, empty the garbage can, why? And it's why. <laughs> and when you say empty the garbage, and we literally did this example yesterday at the academy. Uh, and she comes back and says why. And then you say empty the garbage can, because that's what we train them. We're not going to answer why, because that's not the point. Empty the garbage can. And she comes back with, well, why are you making me empty the garbage can? You didn't make Kelly empty the garbage can. And then we say again, empty the garbage can. <clears throat> we're not yelling, we're not mad. But we're staying on course. So, empty the garbage can. Now she comes back and says, well, you didn't ask me to empty the garbage can yesterday. Why are you asking me today? Naturally, what people think is you're either being manipulative, you're a jerk, or you're being argumentative. Well, that's not what we train. What we say is, I don't know if I, can I ask you a question? Who, me? Well, the committee. Oh. Can I, I don't know if I can ask. Can I ask? But yeah. So you might not like to <laughs> Well, no. Why is it that you think that she's asking those questions? Attention. Okay, could be attention. We'll go with attention. No one else has an answer. Perceived I mean, no persecution. Perceived persecution. Yeah, to gain respect. To gain respect. She's gaining. <clears throat> so listen. If we go back to that example of Nina, or what we know about women in, in the world. Women experience sexual abuse and domestic violence at a young age, and it's usually with a very close partner, either a family member, s someone who has defined for you what love is, right? Your sense of self-being. This is not an external. Where we know young boys experience sexual violence, usually through a connection, not that family member, um, more so anyway, uh, where it is um, like a coach or um, no. uh, a, a, a friend's family member, priest, that kind of thing. So her sense of self and her trust wheel has been ruptured very early. So when you say to her, empty the trash can, her history in life has said, the people who are supposed to care about me, I don't know if they do. So when she says why, she's not 
She's not being disruptive. <clears throat> She's assessing, are you one of the good ones or are you one of the bad ones? The only way she can. That's her survival that she's learned, which is why we train staff, don't get mad. She's not challenging you. It sounds like it, but she's not. And in the end, you're gonna win. One, you go home, and two, whatever you want done will be done. So you don't need to get mad about it. You don't need to cause a big kerfuffle over it. It'll happen. So just simply say, empty the trash. Please empty the trash and go about your way. And then when you come back and you see she's emptied the trash, thank her for emptying the trash. That is Women's Corrections 101. And we have to train our staff that that is going to be your entire day, which you can imagine, that's why some people on the outside will say, I'll take a use of force, because I do not want to sit there and listen to why all day long. But I'll tell you what, the staff we have are incredible at it. So patient and so understanding. That doesn't mean everybody's awesome and it doesn't mean everybody has a great day. But that is working with women. But you can see why when you have a disciplined structure and if you don't teach communication the right way, that you're gonna write somebody a DR for agitating and provoking. You're gonna write somebody a discipline report for um, being argumentative because you perceive the why as a challenge when it's not. So what about in a situation like that? I'm thinking of the testimony yesterday that Heather gave where there are situations that could be grooming on both ends. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So I could see that situation, that example you just gave, mm -hmm. as an opportunity for grooming on either end. <clears throat> that particular one isn't often what we see as grooming. Um, from the women. Um, the, usually what we see is the intro conversations that are getting personal. They start asking about personal life. Now that's where it's very interesting because we know women are relational and that it's about connection with one another. And so it's the balance of what is you trying to create a connection versus what is you gathering information that then is going to become something else later. And what we train staff is if somebody asks you a personal question, that answer, that question is not inappropriate. If somebody asks you if you have kids, where do you live, um, you know, what do you do, what's your favorite color? I mean, there's weird questions, but the question itself isn't inappropriate. I mean, first of all, if you go to a high school reunion or a wedding or a family reunion or go on Facebook, that's what's on there. So don't, you can't say now it's inappropriate. It's public and you smatter it all over everywhere. What we say is your answer makes it inappropriate. So if an offender asks me where I live, my response is gonna, mine would be, I live in central Vermont. Why are you asking? Where do you live? Because I don't know why she's asking. And I'll, I'll give you an example of, from my, my own career. I had a woman on my caseload ask me if I was a lesbian. Um, and I said, um, no, I'm not. And uh, the superintendent, I, I think I told my supervisor about it, and the superintendent called me in and told me that I shouldn't have answered the question, that it was a personal question. And I said, well, but it isn't, because I didn't tell her what I was. I could be bisexual. I didn't answer it. I just said I wasn't that. And she said, well, that's personal, and you shouldn't share it. And I said, well, we have staff that wear wedding rings. That's just as much of a reveal. They are saying that they are connected to someone. And she said, it's a slippery slope. And I said, okay, well, all right. So I had another woman on my caseload. I, this might sound weird that I would have two people, but I don't know, I guess it's, I stereotypically look it. And she asked me if I was a lesbian. And I said, well, I cannot answer that question, but why are you asking? The reason she was asking is because she and her partner had just moved here from another state, and they were living in Burlington, and they were not accepted. And she was trying to get from me what I knew about the community because she was trying to figure out, was she being isolated because she identified Native American, her partner was African American, or was that just how the community was? She didn't know. And so when I shut her down by saying, I can't answer that question. Now, because I said, well, why are you asking? I then got what she needed. But it's very easy for a person to think that that could be manipulative or we're grooming. She wasn't grooming anything. She was asking a completely appropriate question of, I'm new here, what do I need to know? 
And so we train staff, and we have to train staff on how to answer and how to respond, not not answering and shutting those things down, which is what we do. And um, on Tuesday, I trained the academy. It just so happened I was just there this week, uh, mm -hmm. eight hours on um, Priya and staff sexual misconduct, and we talk about that very thing. When somebody asks you a question, what do you say? And we train them. And I am very clear with people. It is rude to say I'm not answering that. It is rude to say that's none of your business. It's rude to say around. That's, that's one that's that, if you don't train somebody to properly answer the question, you get what they would say in the world. Where are you from? Around. Imagine if someone said that to you. That's horrible. And so we, that's not an answer. If somebody, if, you don't have to say, well, I live, obviously I live in the state. Why are you asking? Oh, well, because my family's looking to move here, and I want to know about the area. Oh, all right, well, what is it that you're looking to know? If I can't answer it, maybe I know who can. Mm -hmm. See, you've given them what they need, and it had nothing to do with you. That is where grooming starts. Um, and <laughs> the other thing we'll see is um, it's no surprise with what I've talked about when women are victims of sexual and domestic violence um, at a very early age, that becomes a part of their life. Uh, and boundaries, they're not taught appropriate boundaries. Love, a matter of fact, another section of the, in the video of, of Healing Mean, this one woman talks about how love was hitting because that's what she grew up in and then that's what she had experienced. And so when she looked for a partner, she looked mm -hmm. for someone that hit her. And she said, when he wasn't hitting me, I was hitting him. Um, because that's what it was. And, you know, someone else, uh, one of the members of the, of the class actually said, yeah, it was true, and my, I grew up in a pretty rough house and yelling. Everybody was always yelling. And so when I was looking at partners, I was looking at partners that were yelling because that's what I knew. Um, and so what we see in the correctional facility is these really lax boundaries and this over-sexualized. Because let's face it, if you have spent your life getting what you need from your body, then that's exactly what you're gonna to keep doing in a facility. When you want something, you're gonna use the thing that has gotten you what you've got that you needed before. And so what we'll see is women leaning on the podium, um, altering their outfit so that they're a little more exposed. Um, they'll stand, uh, if you haven't been in the units, um, a lot of times the phone that the inmates use is close to the officer's podium. So once they're through with the phone, they'll kind of, uh-oh, see, look at that. No, I mean, we haven't even made it past the first slide, Bill. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> I hope you've scrolled through it on your own. <laughs> um, but they stand close. Um, and they stand close. And I, I said this, we actually had a, a staff member. We had received a report. There was an allegation that came forward. Um, that the inmates were reporting that this officer was engaged in a sexual relationship with this woman. So the first thing we do is we pull up video, because that's the easiest thing to do, right? Let's pull it up, let's see what we can see. And what we watched is, um, so it, this is actually a very similar uh, scenario. So imagine this is the podium, and the unit phone is, is right here. And she comes out, and she's on the phone. And then she stands here like this, and he's standing there at the podium. And we watch him, take a step. He creates away the distance from away from her. So then what does she do? Takes a step toward him. She takes a step towards him. And no exaggeration, all the way around the podium. <laughs> and he doesn't even realize it. So what did we do? We pulled him in. And we said, tell us about what you do in your unit. So we did. And then we said, okay, tell us what happens when this goes on. And he's like, oh, well, I would do this, I would do this. And we said, what's the best tool? We pulled up the video. And we said, take a look at this. And we watched him go. <laughs> he didn't realize he was even He had no him. idea. And so now what we have to do is two things. One, we have to set an expectation with him. Now, we've already trained him, but it doesn't matter. We now need to remind him, that's your podium. You own that. You're responsible for creating that boundary, so you have to create that boundary now. If that were you, if you were that staff member and you walked out of the office, you're thinking, uh-oh, I'm on their radar. I might be at risk of getting fired. So now I got to go crack the whip. We know that that's what staff are going to think. So we say, hold on. 
So I say to them, what are you going to do? How are you going to approach this with her? And you get the look. I don't know, because they haven't thought about it. So we literally template it with them. And every single staff member, this is what I've said to them, you go up to her. You find her first and you say, I haven't done right by you. My job is to make sure that you're safe and that you're doing what you're supposed to. <clears throat> so when I don't address certain behavior, I'm not helping you succeed. And one of the things I've done is I've let you hang out by this podium and I want you to know my commitment to you is I'm not gonna do that anymore. So when you see that happen and you see that change, this is my change. And I wanted you to know up front so you weren't surprised. Because the last thing you ever wanna do with a woman is change things up. Because what's <clears throat> the first thing she thinks? What did I do? I thought we had a thing. It doesn't mean it was sexual, right? We had a relationship, we had a something, and now you're different. He must be mad at me. She must not like me. I did something to upset them. No, nope. no you didn't. I didn't do my job. And so we send them with that template because that's our job. We want them to be successful and we want the women to not be surprised and to not have that trauma trigger of my world changed I don't know why, it must be my fault. Nope, not your fault at all. We had a, another, uh, this was shortly, oh sorry, go ahead. I have a question. Absolutely, I'm sorry. So Heather, you, you just explained a situation where you have a, a current employee um, committing, just, just, I don't even thought, just, just doing something different that might be outside the norm. Correct, yep. So you pulled that employee in, yep. you retrained that employee, yep. or made some suggestions to him uh, to how to handle that situation. And you just, you know, and then uh, we heard you earlier that you just gave this particular presentation yesterday for four hours to, to the recruits. Yep. Do you do, uh, and what would trigger it, ongoing, every, you know, on a regular basis mm -hmm. training for all your officers so, so that they don't get into the situation that you had, uh, uh, the podium situation? <laughs> is, is there a scheduled thing or do you just do it as needed or? when something happens or because people forget? So I have two answers to that. One, we could always do more. Uh, as you know, the complications around our stipend schedule and required training and hours to fit it in, um, we do as much as we can. Um, it, per the um, federal PREA standards, we have to do the baseline PREA training, which contains a component of this every other year. In the off year, um, we have to do some sort of a reminder. Um, we have to do some sort of education. Um, so, yes, we do. Um, we could always be better. So early on in the discussion, it seems like years ago, it was probably just a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> uh, the chair asked, uh, you know, do you do any of these trainings and reminders during roll call? And the answer yeah. was, at the time, I don't remember the answer without looking it up, but... Yeah. I didn't get, I don't think I heard a really positive response that that was happening on a regular um, basis. Um, so I can only answer um, to when I was there, uh, if we're talking about Chittenden um, specifically. Uh, and it was not like a regular part of roll call um, because roll call is, I mean, it's, 10 to 15 minutes, because it's before shift, um, it's right before they go um, on shift, and you're covering hot topics of that week. Um, so if you have, um, you know, uh, let's say the flu broke out, uh, and you're letting people know that there's stuff going on with the flu, you'd be covering that. If there's, um, if it's been a tough week, uh, and um, let's say we got word that a, a woman who had left um, dot had a, a, a had died due to an overdose, that might be something we would discuss. If we are super short on staff, we would discuss that. Um, if we had received, or if we were aware of more than one issue, or it was one that we were like, yeah, this is a good thing, that's a reminder, um, we would, if we use that case for an example, the, what would have been covered in roll call is a reminder about the podium is your space, um, folks shouldn't be in that area, a reminder about boundaries, um, and making sure that you're maintaining your personal space. That would be what we and would I, have I said. That's what it maybe what was driving at a yeah. little bit. So, something simple, just gen gentle yes. reminders or not some general reminders to the staff that this is this is what we trade. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know, I mean, along with just yep. the sentence. Yep. Sort of and 
I think what you find is a lot of that stuff is going to be um, a more informal delivery because every time management does a tour, if I see any of that, we're pulling that person aside um, and having a conversation with them because I, I hate this expression, but it's useful. You don't know what you don't know. And when you are working in the same unit with the same group of people every day, there's patterns. You become a creature of habit as much as they do because you have to survive in that unit. So if somebody has a bad habit of yelling, then you become used to that yeller. If somebody has, uh, you know, uh, constantly wants to pick a fight over the television, then you know who that person is and you figure out how to management. So, so that's oftentimes the things that'll happen is you become as immersed in that culture as they are. Uh, and so what we have to do is kind of pull them out um, and help be that external mirror of, have you, did you know this was happening? Have you seen this? So we heard, I think we've heard also that pulling people out of units after so many days or after a period of time is good because it breaks the, the uh, trend of familiarity. Where smaller facilities create, uh, I mean, I, I'm thinking Chimney. It's pretty yeah. hard to get away from anybody in Chimney. It's impossible. Uh, in, into a different populated, populated area or, yes. or, or, or whatever. Or the current makeup, and you may not want to answer this, and that would be fine. Mm -hmm. But the current makeup of facilities <laughs> create a, a, a barrier to good uh, personnel practices uh, within correctional facilities. Um, oh, I see why you gave me the out of not answering, but I'm up to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that I do um, in my other life is I am a trainer with the National Institute of Corrections and I travel across the country and how to operate women's facilities. And um, what I will say is that it's a really, uh, first of all, it's, it's incredibly uh, fun um, and you learn so much when you go to other states. And the best thing I've learned is that we're no different than anyone else. Uh, I trained in California. There were three facilities there, and this one guy admitted on day two that he wasn't going to listen to me because, of course, they ask how many inmates you have, and when I say 140, he's thinking, you don't have a clue what you're doing because they got 3, 000, over 3,000 in one institution. And he said, but man, you had me. You, everything you experience, we experience. And I said, well, because people are people. Um, and across the country, the guidance is you got to shift. you got to move people. Um, so when you have bidding rights and post rights, it becomes a problem because a person can bid on a post and stay there kind of forever um, in that if they're the most senior, if you're yeah, somebody who's, that. Mm -hmm, that post would be that. So if, if I bid on a post and I'm, let's say the post I want is house one, because that would never, most, nobody would bid for house one over and over because it's the, one of the busiest units in, at Chittenden. But if I bid on house one and I have 15 years in at Chittenden, there isn't anyone else that's gonna have more seniority than me. I'm gonna get that post every time. Um, and that's true at all of our facilities. So um, having said that, I am not going to say that we should eliminate the ability of folks to bid for a post. I'm saying that nationally, they have identified the risk whether you're at a male facility or a female facility when it comes to over familiarity of someone being able to be in the same location over and over and over again. Well, that really plays into many, many layers here. Is that, is that part of the union contract at all? Or is that part of the larger VSCA contract? That I don't want to answer because I don't know. Okay. And Kirk, I don't want to be wrong. That was okay. my Kirk, question. Marcia, and Mine's the answer. You just Okay. How many lifers do you have in Chittenden? Lifers? Oh, I didn't well, study question. that one. How many lifers do they have in Chittenden? You mm -hmm. mean of offenders, inmates? Yeah. How many with a life sentence? Yeah. I Probably one or two. I was gonna, the only two that I think is Patricia yeah, Prue Patricia, and yeah. Jody Herring, yeah. I think. Just those two? I think. They're made, um, I don't know if she got a post conviction or something or not. There was a third. Yeah. Um, I'm not, yeah, I know who you're talking about. I'm not sure. There might, I mean, I can find that information out. Well, I just, you know, just two. two that's fine. Uh, well, so the, they rock, they rule. Pardon? No. No. What did you say, Marcia? They don't. 
They are, I wondered if they rule because they're the oldest ones. Oh, they've yeah. been there the longest. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't always work that way. That will happen in male institutions. It's not necessarily the same culture in female institutions. Um, it, the dynamics are different um, as far as uh, popularity. Um, you know, in a male institution, aggression rules, strength rules, because that's how we raise men. Um, that they're, uh, what we know is women learn through con connection and women, uh, men learn through differentiation. Um, you look at a playground, king of the hill, right? Little Man. boys that mm -hmm. knock each other off, they're not trying to beat each other up, they're trying to assert themselves because yeah, that's what we have told men they're supposed to do. When you put them in a correctional facility where they're all tough and strong, somebody has to be the strongest. And a pecking order ensues because, and this is what's so important, their masculinity is what keeps them safe. In a female institution, there is no masculinity, there is no femininity, there is no this will keep you safe because the same threats don't apply. That does not mean that women don't assault each other. It does not mean that women don't sexually assault um, each other. It looks different um, in both cases, but it's not what you see. What you actually see is, the, is very similar to what you would see on like an elementary school playground, which is the gaggle. Whoever has the biggest gaggle <laughs> rules. Because that's what happens, right? You, you get your, your you, you make your grouping. Um, and the, the other thing we see is families. They make families in there. Because that's what women want, is they want that close knit. And so you will see women who come in who had children, and now they're in a facility, they don't have their children, and they start taking care of the younger ones. And we have to be all over that, because you will have the... 40-something-year-old or the 30-something-year-old that is doing the laundry of the 20-something-year-old. No. No, you're not. Um, but at the same time, and this is what corrections does, right? It's all about separation. We say every, I, this is my favorite part about corrections, you should not hang around with other criminals. So as soon as you get out of jail, we're going to make you sit in the lobby of a probation and parole office with nothing but criminals. <laughs> you're going to go to groups. But then we say don't don't connect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have a few more questions. Yes, Sarah and So I just have I just wanted to make sure it's it's not re it's a new direction. Oh, sure. so this presentation that you gave this is something that you give to the the cadet. This is part of the all. Yep, yeah, this is at the so, correctional academy. So yep. I noticed that a lot of the data in here is from like the 2000s. Yes, and so it's 20 years old. Yes, and um, and, and while I'm, I don't imagine that. I don't. I don't know. I mean, do you? Uh, how often do you update? How often is training updated? Because um, we've changed. There's been a lot that's happened within corrections thinking. Now you participate in yep. national um, uh, trainings. Like how? And then I have a follow-up question, but maybe you can answer that first. Okay. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yes. And we actually not so. The, unfortunately, the national data slides, they haven't put out new data, um, and it's one of the things that I discussed with the group that I'm with, um, but unfortunately, with some of the funding issues they've had, they have not been able to get the new, the new data that would reflect in the specific stuff that we've discussed. So what we, what we have done is we've amended some of the percentages when we present it, but we haven't amended the slides because it's specific to a survey um, and some research that was done, and so we don't want to modify it to make it look like that was the, the research. So we amend the totals when we, tell, when we present it. So um, is justice the work that, that we're doing with Justice Reinvestment, which has a lot of this data, some of this data in it, will that be helpful to you? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll take whatever data you want to send, absolutely. So one of the follow-up questions that I had is, you know, it's really clear that training needs to be different. It needs to be gender, you know, the training mm -hmm. um, for corrections officers working in a women's facility. It almost sounds to me like it's a specialty in a, in a way. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, we've heard when we visited the facility, a few of us visited the New Hampshire facility, you know, the, 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 the staff there rotate out. Mm -hmm. I'm a little, I would love to, I'm a little unclear of what, um, the policy or the practice is in Vermont with, you know, understanding that there's a, uh, a, a, a need for a different kind of understanding how to work with women in the mm -hmm. facility, mm -hmm. and then this um, inherent problem about familiarity, mm -hmm. over familiarity. So what do people, 
how does how is it working in, in Vermont and what's the practice and policy around that for staff to to be required to move to other facilities after a certain amount of time? Or? We don't have that requirement. Um, and again, we don't have a separate contract um, or personnel policies for staff at the male facilities versus the female facilities. Um, so um, our, our current folks, can, and again, I'm not sure if it's in the contract and in policy, I, I, just because that's not my area of expertise. Um, but folks in the Vermont Department of Corrections can bid for a post and then they can have that post. Um, that is the, that is what occurs. So what I'm hearing is there's a potential for some, Absolutely. you know, over familiarity. I mean, you were, remind us when you were, at, you were the superintendent of this facility, is that right? At I, 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 mean, the facility. Yes, oh, for, for six that. months. Oh boy. <laughs> I don't know the dates. Um, I was at Chittenden for, I've been out of Chittenden for about a year, mm -hmm. and I was there for five years before that. It was right after Superintendent Adams left. I was superintendent for six months, and then um, Cheryl, uh, former Deputy Commissioner Cheryl Oliverta came in, and she was the superintendent. So I'm sorry, I do not know the time frames. No, I'm just curious, um, I'm just curious, like what, what, in, in relationship to the, 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 uh, seven the article? Days. Yeah, article. When, I'm referenced when, in it, yes. In, in answer to your, I, yeah, if that's no, this it, was yeah. like, So you know what we're talking like, yes. about. You're very familiar yes. with what we're talking about. Very familiar with what you're talking about, yes. Um, and then, then, then what she might be able to say. Yeah, I understand that. Well, yeah. <laughs> well and I think, I didn't know. Yeah, we got more questions. Yeah. Did you finish yeah, answering no, this? Yeah. Was that, that was just, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, Yes, I would love the data. We can always be better. Um, and the one other thing I did want to say is that, because um, we talked about this with the class yesterday, is this unit is done at the academy because the riskiest time for inmates is their first 24 to 48 hours. They're not at Chittenden for the first 24 to 48 hours. They're at the men's institutions. And the staff Unless at Chittenden- they happen to come from Chittenden County. Correct, correct. Um, which, that's actually, some of the tiniest numbers we have. Um, the majority of the women are coming from Hartford, White River, Rutland, um, St. Johnsbury, Central Vermont. Maybe they're we not use Windsor. They're not coming from Chittenden, which is a huge shift. When the women were moved to Chittenden, that's where the majority of them came from. Um, but they learn because they have to in in the work. We apply the how it affects women differently in all of the trainings. The staff that work in a male facility have learned, they learn a way to communicate. They communicate with men all the time. And then they get a woman that comes in and it's a shift. And so when we open this training, that's the first thing we say, is I ask them, how many of you in here think that you don't really need to listen to this because you're not going to Chittenden? And they're all like, me. And I'm like, listen up, because you need this more than they do. Um, and I mean, that's just the nature of the work. And so what we do after this is, um, we incorporate this stuff into ACT, into, oh, sorry, advanced communication techniques, into non-lethal use of force, into use of restraints, into contraband and searches, into first aid CPR, mental health and medical issues. It's, we, we cover these principles in greater detail and we put them in all the trainings because what we can't do is say, well, I went to women offenders training so I know women. No, you don't. That was one unit. And treating it like one unit and specialized is just silly. You need to know how those principles all apply to people you're working with, and it needs to be pervasive, not just a one-time, one-stop shopping. Um, and so a lot of these components are then moved into those units that they get throughout their stipend schedule every year. Um, so that was, I, I did want to make sure that I said that. So we have more questions. Which and then Kirk. Thank you, you did answer my question. Oh, we didn't know you did answer my question. Phew, okay. <laughs> uh, but we won't go into that. So could could we say, but first of all, post, when you're talking to post, is yes. the post within the facility or yes. just the facility? No, uh, sorry, so booking, um, mm -hmm. alpha unit, house one, ha those are considered posts. Okay, wow. So would you could you say that best practice for managing uh, employees within our in any facility is, is a, a rotation of people throughout that facility? I will say that best practice in, it would encourage you to review that. I won't say that best practice is explicit that you should move people. 
but best practice would say you should review what your policies are, review how your incidents are occurring, and should you be doing that? Me, you meaning you as the DOC or as the you DOC. meaning us? No, oh, no, no, as a DOC. <laughs> yeah, no, not you. At the Department of Corrections as a whole and then facility specific should be looking at, because you may have, so for example, booking <clears throat> at Chittenden, there are two officers in booking. So that might be an example where you would not need to rotate that post because it's you and someone else. Uh, not to mention the fact that there's so many things that happen in booking, you're not doing the same thing. You take a post like Bravo, that's a more, in Chittenden, that's a more isolated post because when you walk in, you go down a hallway and go around and the unit officer's desk is over there. So somebody walking by can't see. Now you go to house one, everybody and their cousin is walking by that unit door all the time. So they can see in. So it's harder for something to occur. House two, the only unit that's upstairs. Uh, and so that's more isolated. So that might be a post where you would look at rotating, but you would have to look at do incidents occur in those units more often than not? Do sexual misconduct incidents occur in that unit more often than not? Because you, you want to be smart about it. Um, and then maybe it's that you, maybe best practice would say that you change the way you do training for those posts. So they might have training required um, annually uh, versus rotating the post. It, it would have the flex, but you, best practice is you should look at it to determine what is best. Um, and if that would be beneficial to the staff and the population. Thank you. Um, two questions, and I can put them in hand, and then you make it one question. But okay. um, do which which COs re receive this specific training, the eight hours of that you're talking about here, and um, what is? Can you be a, talk a little bit about stipend training? Yes. Um, every single correctional officer that is hired by the Vermont Department of Corrections receives eight hours of this, regardless of what facility they're going to. Okay. Um, stipend training um, is currently what we use in that um, there's 10 hours of stipend training um, that a person can get paid for by a stipend rate, and then after that, it's overtime. Um, our stipend schedules at the facilities, frankly, are full with their core comps because um, they have mandated core comps. So advanced communication techniques, non-lethal use of force, fire safety, first aid CPR. Yeah, yes, advanced communication techniques, <coughs> if I didn't say that. I feel like I'm missing one. That's okay. um, but when you look at 10 hours, the advanced communication techniques is four four-hour units. So that's spread out through the, through the year. But for a correctional officer, they are required to attend those core competencies um, in order to get a satisfactory, or at least a satisfactory evaluation. So they would have to attend those every single year. Otherwise, they would get an unsatisfactory evaluation until they completed those and could be terminated um, because they are required to have those, those baseline trainings. And they're obviously all the most important ones. Um, now, what has happened with the federal PREA standards and uh, also the direction the agency was taking and the department was taking before the article coming out is sexual harassment is required. Well, it's not a core comp because it's not one of those mandatory supplements for a correctional officer, but the state says you must do it. So that got added in. And then uh, there's specific training under the federal PREA standards that's required. So we now have more required training than we have hours for. Um, and that is um, an issue. So, quarter ten. A few of us have talked up here. We need a break. <laughs> so, this might be a good time to okay. to stop and continue in about two, three minutes, five minutes at the most. Just take a quick break uh, and come back, and we'll continue. And there's some other documents here too. <laughs> so maybe we can get to some of those other. Move off the first slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and boys and uh, that we have in our facilities as well their first safe experience is in our correctional facilities it's the first time they haven't worried about being attacked um, they haven't worried about their power being shut off uh, not knowing you know what they're gonna wake up to the next morning um, because the reason why jails are structured the way that they are is because then you know what to expect it's the same thing every day um, and so 
the other point of that is for the males that we hire to understand that you might be the first male in her life that has looked her in the eye, that hasn't requested sex from her, that hasn't touched her, that hasn't yelled at her, that hasn't disrespected her, and understanding how important and powerful that is. Um, and one statement that I have made um, publicly everywhere I've been is there are some folks out there who are under the school of thought that you should have same gender working together. Um, so you have women working in a women's correctional facility, and I don't support that. Um, and the reason I don't support that is because men can provide something to women offenders that a woman never can, which is value. Value from men, um, where they are not hurting you and they are respecting you. And it is so important for the women to experience that before they leave, when they are clean, when they are sober, um, when they are able to see it and hear it. Um, so even if it means they only experience it one time, it's one time that they got to experience it. Um, and I will say that anyone who thinks that if you have a woman in distress, that you should always send a woman in, doesn't know what they're doing. Because more often than not, when we have a woman in distress, it's actually the men that we send in um, because there is a different line of communication um, and it is more um, receptive, it is, it's heard better, um, and she feels more valued. Um, uh, hearing, like having a man validate how she's feeling. Um, and so, yeah, th that was all I wanted to say on, on that. So I did come uh, to talk with you guys already about gender care and custody um, and around what that means. Uh, and so if you've already looked ahead at the slides, you'll see uh, that literally what we're doing is we are defining lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning and intersex. Um, the first slide that shows some articles, these are um, real articles that are, have come out uh, since we have been delivering this training. Um, one of the most disturbing ones that we uh, talk about with the, the class is the top one, the California Attorney General vows to halt ballot measure that would legalize killing gay people. There was a gentleman who um, in California had submitted a bill um, in which uh, if you were caught engaging in homosexual activity, uh, you were to be sentenced to death. Uh, and if the state did not carry out the sentence, then the citizens of California were ordered to do it. Uh, and it was specific that it was by bullet to the head. And the reason we put this article up here is because what we get from more than anyone is, did you make that up, is that real? Um, and it, people need to know that, that that is a belief set. And you know, we train correctional staff to leave their personal values at home, but that you can't do that. I don't care who you are. That's, that would be like anybody expecting you guys to leave your personal values at home. Um, you have them, but there is a way that you have to norm them uh, so that you're not in conflict because it's not about you. Uh, and so one of the things that's really important is we teach people diversity, right? We say that it is, you cannot discriminate. If you don't like someone's sexual orientation or someone's gender, that's fine. You can have your own opinion, but you can't discriminate. And so that means we have to train staff that when you have an offender that has a new cellmate moves in and that person's transgender, the world does not have a great understanding of transgender. And if we're talking about men, there is a great misconception that transgender equals gay and gay equals predator. Just not true. But that is the <clears throat> perception that's out there among men because sexuality is attached to masculinity, which in corrections is your safety. And so we have to train staff that if someone comes out and says, I don't want that such and such in my cell, they have to acknowledge that that person's afraid and they're allowed to be. Well, what they cannot do is discriminate or assault anyone. And so we have to coach them in how to respond where you are valuing that person's feel, that their feelings and what they've said without telling them that it's okay to discriminate, but also letting them know what the expectation is. And that's a balance. Um, because the federal PREA standards, appropriately so, has, have identified the extreme vulnerability of the LGBTQI population. I talked with you guys a little bit that this is a, a graphic that we use because it's really helpful for folks to understand what all these things mean. Because keep in mind, we have 20 something year olds and we have 60 something year olds that we're hiring. And if you're 
of the more mature end of the age spectrum, you have never heard of any of these things. And so learning this is complicated. And so what we do is we use this as a means to help folks understand when we're talking about transgender, we're talking about the brain, we're talking about how a person thinks about their gender. When we're talking about intersex, which is the new term for hermaphrodite, which is the, it's a biological medical condition affecting genital status, that's your sex. That has nothing to do with what you think. It has everything to do with how you're born and your anatomy. And then expression is the whole thing because it's this simple. If I walked into this room and I said my name was John and I <coughs> said I wanted to be called he, you'd probably repeat it the first time, but the second time you'd look at me and you'd say, you see a woman and you'd naturally say she because that's what you've been raised to do. So your expression will change because if I want you to treat me as male, then I have to show you male. Otherwise, it's just really hard for folks to remember because it looks different. Uh, and so we use this tool to help folks really understand. And so we'll literally go through and we'll say, okay, lesbian, where is that on the gender bread person? It's the heart. So it helps with that visual reminder as we go through it. Um, it's, a, it's a really useful uh, tool for folks. Uh, in the Vermont Department of Corrections, I, we've talked about this uh, before, uh, inmates when they come in, they identify as transgender. Um, they let us know their preferred name. Uh, first name only, they can't change their legal name with us, uh, their last name. They can have it changed through the court, but not through us. Um, so they would let us know their preferred name. So if it's me and I said my preferred name is John, we would write down John. I say I want to be called he uh, or him. So you would indicate he or him. I can also choose they if I wish for my pronoun. Um, that would be indicated on the paper. And then we say, is there anything that you use to aid in the presentation of male in the outside world? If I said I used a chess binder, um, that I wore uh, men's briefs, um, you would indicate that on the form. I would be allowed to purchase male underwear off of commissary. Um, we don't provide underwear to the male inmates. We do provide underwear to female inmates. So cisgender females and transgender females can get underwear from the department. They can get bra and underwear because we provide them. Uh, males, cisgender males do not get underwear. The department doesn't provide to them. Therefore, we will not um, provide uh, undergarments to transgender males, but they could order it from commissary. Um, but if we have a transgender female that's requesting makeup, because cisgender uh, females can order uh, makeup off of commissary, transgender females can order makeup off of commissary. Um, a chest plate uh, would also be something that a person can request. If they come in with it, they keep it. Same thing with a prosthetic penis. Our uh, directive actually says that if someone comes in with it, it's explicit, uh, that if someone comes in with it, we will do a search, but the person will keep the item. Um, and then the individual uh, can request uh, they can uh, state who they want to do the pat search, uh, and we, have, we are now in the process of amending our policy to reflect strip search as well. So if I came in and said I wanted to be pat searched by a male and strip searched by a male, um, that would be indicated on the form. That form then goes to central office where the facilities executive, Al Cormier, um, our medical, uh, the person who is currently in charge of our medical, which is Max Titus, who was here last week, I think, uh, and then myself, I'm only in an advisory role. Um, they, they make the decisions and I advise on what's best practice. Um, and they would uh, make a recommendation to the commissioner. Uh, so uh, for those that know, um, we did have a transgender female at one of our male institutions. Um, and the staff uh, believed that she would actually have a much better experience at, a, at Chittenden. Um, had a conversation with her. She agreed. She said that she would like to move if she could. We staffed it. She went to Chipman. Uh, she was pat searched and strip searched by female uh, officers, um, and she lived in the unit. Um, and so, again, when we're talking about someone who's transgender, we're talking about someone who is, uh, to, I'm not going to scroll all the way through, but sex male um, identifies female. Um, and she was housed at uh, Chipman. Uh, and we, that is what our process would be for anyone that requests it. But the individual has to ask for it. Um, we might initiate a conversation or let them know it's an option if we think someone would benefit from it. Um, hormones, the way hormones used to be, uh, is um, 
our medical, our old medical contractor, like, I don't know, a bunch ago, uh, did not provide uh, hormones. They believed it was elective. Uh, so there was a transgender male at Dale. That's how long ago this was. Wow. Uh, yeah. That wow. Had, yeah. Uh -huh. that not at me. Don't say the 90s, you're making me older, it's 2000. Yeah, because I started there. Yeah, we, it opened in 2000. Um, and so the medical contractor wouldn't give uh, him his hormones that he had been on for a long time. The department actually said, give them. Uh, and he sued and he won. And what the judge said is, if an individual is coming into a correctional facility, you must maintain what they're on, but they can't add it. Well, we have since ignored that. Uh, in the good way, not the bad way. Uh, in our medical contractor, if somebody requests hormones and it makes medical sense and that's all a medical decision, they'll be put on hormones regardless of whether they were on it in the street or not. That's our current medical practice. Uh, and um, we actually, our most recent is we have an individual um, that is requesting uh, gender reassignment surgery. Um, I don't know if that has formally um, come through, but I would expect that's going to be coming through shortly. Um, and frankly, we should expect that it's going to come through. Uh, and I mean, other states have been, uh, Massachusetts granted uh, and paid for uh, gender reassignment surgery over a decade ago uh, for an inmate. Um, so this is the, the new expectation. I will say the same, so when we first started doing this work, um, our superintendents were very concerned, especially those at the male facilities, because what they said is we are going to have men who are separated from women, who are now gonna identify as transgender so they can get pat searched by women. And I said, I double dog dare you, let's see how it goes. And here's why I say that. I have made it very clear how men remain safe in a correctional facility is their masculinity. So when they identify as transgender, they are opening themselves up to victimization, persecution, judgment, ridicule. So it's not just as simple as saying I'm transgender. And guess what? We've never had more than 20 inmates at one time that have identified as transgender. And to my knowledge, at this point, we have only had two who have chosen accommodations because they were attempting to get something and those were addressed. Um, it is not the epidemic because there, it's so much different for men um, to identify that way. Uh, and we don't have, uh, we. Uh, Chittenden at one point had, I think we had four transgender males. Um, and it was before this procedure was even in place. And we were, uh, matter of fact, on our first audit uh, with um, our first federal PREA audit, uh, the auditor actually wrote uh, in the audit report, which uh, you guys might have at, at, at Chittenden's, it reflects uh, she was really impressed with the work that we did um, because Chittenden is the most diverse facility you have. And so you've got a lot of, I'll say new age thinking or more updated mm -hmm. thinking. And so our staff, this is not an issue. But since you are the House Institutions Committee, the one thing I will say is when we're talking about gender care and custody, we can't forget about staff. And we know that we have hired staff that are intersex uh, and that are transgender. And we don't decide our personnel policies. And there is no uh, state regulation around what to do. And the reason why is because in most jobs, we say it's gender neutral. Well, in our job, it isn't. We have policies that mandate certain things for men and certain things for women. And here's the thing to consider. If you are an inmate and you have to get searched, who should search you? <clears throat> because if I walked in to get hired by the Department of Corrections, and my example is before, and I presented as this and said my name is John, through DMV, I can change my gender on my license with no other documentation, so I change my license to say I'm male, but I look like this. It is fair to say that if I went to do a strip search of a man, that he might have a problem with that. And who wins? I don't have the answer to that question. I'm, bringing it up is something for folks to, to consider and think about. Um, I will say that uh, the question has been asked to the uh, PREA Resource Center because the federal PREA standards have, as you know, because it's been discussed, uh, rules and regulations around cross-gender searches. And the question has been asked, the word is cross-gender, not cross-sex. 
we can assume someone's gender. We don't know their, right? We can assume their sex. We don't know their sex. I don't know what physical anatomy someone has. So if, again, I tell you I'm male, I present female, male is my gender, so then I would not be performing pat searches or strip searches on women. So if I went to the women's facility and I said, hmm, I don't feel like doing strip searches or pat searches, I could choose to identify as male, change nothing except call me John, and I don't have to do pats or strip searches, technically. We have not had anyone do this, so I don't, I don't want to cause <laughs> cause alarm or say that I'm concerned this is this is coming um, it's possible right now uh, and so that is something to keep in mind when we're talking about this very uh, material um, that we have to keep in mind about staff and one of the things that I did share is I was training this at the Academy and we were we had a break and I had um, I, I will go back so in case anyone this definition of intersex and I had a, a participant approach me um, and they, uh, I would put them in their mid-twenties, and they said, I think that's me. And I said, what do you mean? Because I really had no idea what they were talking about. And they said, I think that's me. I think I'm intersex. And the look on their face was this look of, like, relief and, like, a light bulb dawned. Um, and I said, oh, really? Now, in my head and my heart, I'm devastated. And I'm devastated because no one should learn their gender status, their sex status, from somebody training at a correctional academy. That's terrible. I mean, that is terrible. Um, and I said, okay, well, that's great. Um, and they started saying things like, you know, I've been on hormone treatment. I, I don't do this. I don't do that. Um, this is different. And now I think I understand why. And I said, well, um, we work with the Pride Center uh, out of Burlington. Would it be helpful for you to have a conversation with someone who is an expert uh, in this? Because that's not me. Um, and they said, yeah, I, th I think that would, that would be great. And I said, OK. Um, so I, I, I did say that, you know, I'll let the uh, academy director, James Rice, know so that I can get in the information. And they were like, yeah, that's fine. So I reached out to the Pride Center and I told them what had happened and they said, absolutely, here's our point person, gave that number to the academy, they got it to the participant, they called, uh, they came up to me at graduation to tell me, thank you so much, I spoke with them, they'd gotten all this information, there you go. Do you have, did you have something? I do. Yes, we're looking at the time too. Yeah, so just we have ten more minutes. Okay. So I don't know how quickly you can answer this. If you can't, that's fine. Take take it off on. <clears throat> so I want to swing back to the employees a little bit, and I would yes. like you to go back to that ID card you just showed on the screen. So when a, when a, an inmate comes in, yep. uh, and the, the they have to fill out their legal name. Yeah. Uh, and and if they and then they then they can fill out their preferred name, and so. And I, I take this from a little bit of personal experience. Uh, so I, uh, I, somebody comes in and they want to identify as, mm -hmm. as a female, so mm -hmm. their preferred name is, is Jane. Yep. However, their legal name is John. Mm -hmm. So the, the, in, the correction officer knows this mm -hmm. because he sees this form. So, and maybe that person that wants to be identified is not really transitioned mm -hmm. yet mm -hmm. to more a more female status. So the, the, our employee calls the inmate John. And what happens? Is, is, there, uh, is there any, I can't imagine a disciplinary thing coming along, but there, there could be, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I mean, what happens? I experienced this personally uh, many years, not many years ago, 15 years ago or so, and I have a friend of 30 years transition. Mm -hmm. And uh, to this day, mm -hmm. uh, occasionally I will, will call her by his male name. And we always have a laugh about it when, when it happens. Yep. But, but uh, you know, not out of any malice, but just out of habit, I guess. Yep. Uh, I can answer that one. Uh, so staff are trained that if you make a mistake, you acknowledge the mistake. 
So if you identify the inmate, so if it's Kelly and she's going by the name John, then I, if I said Kelly, then I would say, sorry, John. I mean, it's that simple. Um, we also tell staff that for staff that are concerned that they're going to get it wrong or make a mistake, and a lot of staff do this anyway, they use last names. So her last name is Chamberlain, so I would refer to her as Chamberlain. That's not wrong. Um, the same thing would go as if I used the wrong pronoun. If I said she and I meant to say he, I would acknowledge the mistake. Now, so it would be, cons it's a low level, um, but let's say that um, John came forward and issued a complaint. Um, we pull the staff person in and we we've had it happen. The staff person says, yeah, totally did, it was a mistake. We remind them, you know the accommodation, you know, yes I do, okay. Now, if two things, one, it's only John, that that staff member does it with, hmm, mm. we now gotta look at that. And, or if the person does it continually. Then it's the difference between performance and misconduct, right? Negligence versus mistake. And that's how we would handle that. If we had a person that was only doing it with John or doing it continually, it would become a misconduct issue. Or, um, so would that rise to the level of uh, uh, sexual misconduct? Uh, it would be it would be discrimination and potentially harassment. Um, that's what we would be investigating it as because um, it would it would fit under harassment is sexual harassment that you, because it's discrimination. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep pointing at John uh, because so you treat, transgender you treat is a protected class. Give the employee the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. The uh, again, if the if the offender came forward and said this happens, let's say it was one report, the very first report, but. He does this all the time. He's That's snarky when he says it, or she's snarky when she says it, or she laughed when she said it, or said, you're not a real woman, or you're not a real man. Oh, it's been elevated. That's not gonna get the benefit of the doubt. We're now looking at it as well. You can get that inmate to inmate. Oh, absolutely, when we have. You get it more inmate to inmate than you do staff to inmate. Do we do, and when that has occurred, um, it's been because we will have some inmates that will identify, and then they will modify their identification. Um, I can tell you there's a transgender male um, uh, that's been at Chittenden that has changed uh, their gender uh, four times. Um, and so what happens is the staff get, uh, the staff, uh, the, the staff get worried because they're afraid they're going to get it wrong because they don't remember what the new one is. Um, and the inmates will say things like, I'm not calling you that. You can't make up your mind. Why do I have to? And then the officer has to address that. But what I want to say is I don't want you guys to go down the path of um, that a person would do that because they're messing with the system because remember the folks that we have have experienced such levels of trauma. Um, that and your gender identity is very much connected to that sense of self which has been disrupted and what we will see for folks that have experienced sexual trauma it can impact their identity of gender uh, and so you can have at times folks that will identify um, male uh, and then identify female when there have been trauma triggered um, because they are reverting uh, or regressing and we actually have um, in here, what do I do? Be aware of them, use the right ones. Use the right words, get your information from staff. Your words make it acceptable or unacceptable, so, and that it's confidential in the sense that it should be on a need to know basis, so obviously we have to tell each other, but you're not chatting about it at the water cooler. Um, and it says in there that um, if you make a mistake, somewhere in here, <laughs> Um, oh yeah, planned ignorant is not a pass, so if you're not reading your emails or checking your clipboard, then you're being negligent. You are expected to know. Admit what you don't know and accept the fact you may sometimes say the wrong thing. Be human, that's what we train staff to do. So another one of your documents is talking about uh, prison rate. Mm -hmm. And we have said many times when receive a sentence to be incarcerated, it's not a sentence to be raped. Can we sum up that article or what occurs within five minutes? Yes. The it's point of a tough one. The point of that article that and you'll get it from the content itself is to understand that we view rape and sexual assault differently with males than we do with females. Specifically that article is about inmates, not staff, so I want to be clear, we're talking about male inmates. This notion that real men don't get raped and that those that engage in sexual activity in a correctional facility are gay. 
The numbers don't lie. The majority of sexual incidents that occur in a correctional facility are with males who identify as heterosexual, not homosexual. Those who are likely to be victimized are more likely to be young, effeminate, LGBTQI, or the perception of LGBTQI. Um, sex offenders, um, because of the pecking order, they're seen to be the worst, so it's fine that they get victimized. Um, and we are not talking about folks who are looking for love. We are talking about the same thing you see on the streets. These are folks who want something and they will take what they want. We know in correctional, male correctional facilities there's a phenomenon called protective partnering. And I'll do this really quickly. Phil, do you mind if I use you only an example alone? Just <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to, we'll have to do anything. So, He's part of the I'm the youngest, smallest. Phil's the tallest. Kelly's the next tallest. He's the kingpin in the unit. She's second. They don't. <laughs> they don't. They they are on terms where it is they know not to mess with each other. So what happens is Phil makes it clear because I came in, I was new, I didn't know any better. And he, get, he offered me something, and I took it. And now I can't pay it back. So Phil has made it clear that he's going to get it back, and he's going to get it back through sex. So I now know I'm going to be sexually assaulted by him. Ugh. In swoops Kelly. Now, Kelly's no dummy. She doesn't really care about me, but she knows how the system works. So what she says is, I'll take care of Phil for you. <laughs> You're going to take care of me. Now, here's what I know. Phil does not have my best interest at heart, and it's going to be violent. Kelly at least appears to be giving me some choice. So what happens is I pick Kelly because it involves less trauma, keeping in mind that both are awful. But I pick Kelly, she takes care of Phil, keeps him off my back, and it looks like we're in a consenting relationship. That is protective partnering. That is what we see at male institutions. And where does uh, opioids come into that? Believe it or not, um, or contraband, we don't, drugs actually have a greater impact on the women, I, from what I've seen in the data of sexual abuse and misconduct in, a correctional, in the correctional setting, and it's because the women want the drugs, and they will do anything to get it, and we have women in that facility that will exploit them. Uh, and so it's not going to be necessarily sex, but it'll be making out, it'll be property, and it's all, they are a slave to that addiction. Um, we, in the male facility, it's more about power. And it's control. power and control. And who's, um, the, who's the alpha male? Yeah. And you will see every educational video, and I'm happy to send you uh, New York's video, because the, uh, the Moss Group actually worked with New York Department of Corrections to design their video, and it's awesome. And the correctional officers watch both the male video and the female video in Vermont before they go through the PREA unit. And it's inmates saying things like, this is what you don't know, right? Kindness is offering someone something. So uh, just let, you just offered me fruit because you, you were eating it and you were like, would you like a piece of fruit? That was very nice. In a correctional facility, it's not nice. I am offering you fruit so that I can now charge you interest and get more back from you. It is not kindness. And so you will see these inmates in this video saying, do not take anything from anyone. You will see, they'll say, you come in your cell and your laundry, because, you know, your laundry positions, your laundry's in your cell, and on top of it is a Snickers bar. Don't you eat that Snickers bar. You carry that Snickers bar out into the day room. You say, thank you very much, I'm all set, and you put it down. But imagine you don't know that. You are young, you're small, you're in a jail, you're terrified. You walk in, you see a Snickers bar, and you say, oh, thank God, I'm going to be okay. Mm -mm. It's 100% the opposite. That is what we see. And it looks like courting, then it goes violent. With the women, it looks like courting and it will stay as courting. And it's this perception of love and there's a relationship until it ends. And it's an abrupt ending, but it's not violent. With the men, it's violent. The old notion of don't drop, don't drop the soap, the soap comes later. Because <laughs> what it is is, I now owe you something and you're gonna take it in the shower. But the soap is just that catchphrase that people use. That's what that article is about. And you have to understand, I mean, we literally have had men say to us, not correctional officers, in my personal life that have said, if you eliminate prison rape, you are eliminating the greatest deterrent for men to, commit, to stop committing crimes. It's literally what I've had men say to me. Say that again. The fear of getting raped 
is what stops them from committing crimes. Hmm. If we were to eliminate prison rape, what reason do men have to not go to jail? Now, that's men wow. telling me, and if that's real, that's terrifying. That is, that is a societal statement right there. I believe to some extent that's real. One thing I do want to say about that is, and I know uh, Director Simon said this in earlier testimony, Vermont's some of the safest facilities in the country. I mean, our auditor was telling us about how another institution that she did an audit at, um, where they had passed and she was hired to go in and re-audit them because there was a belief they should not have passed, this facility was not doing headcount. And they were not doing headcount because the inmates just moved around whenever they wanted to. And the reason they weren't doing headcount is they couldn't account for inmates, and it's because they were kidnapping one another and forcing them to live under their beds oh to use as sex slaves. And this is not 10 years ago. This is within the last couple of years that that's happening. We have never had that, an incident even close to that in our facilities. Uh, that does not mean we have not had males that, or females that have been victimized, because we have. Um, did I did I make it? Yeah, you made it. We're close. We just have to be downstairs in six yep. minutes. Oh. So. Oh, it's not that far. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we it's all, it's all downstairs. Okay.